Okay, we'd like to welcome everyone to Workers' World. My name is Tony Murphy. I'll be chairing tonight's meeting. We'd like to show, <coughs> we'd like to remind comrades and friends, please avoid talking or walking around to show maximum respect to our speakers and the discussion. If you mu must take up business with comrades, please go out in the hall. We'd like to remind everyone to turn their phones off or put them on vibrate, and as much as possible, please fill in the seats in the front of the hall. Take the latest issue of our paper. The headline is Protest Save Brooklyn Hospital. That's a victory. Let's have a hand for that. This is a very uh, packed issue. It's uh, got reports on the, the delegation that we're going to hear about tonight, the delegation to Syria, um, a report from the AFL-CIO convention, the statement that we passed out there, um, articles about the crisis in Detroit, uh, the the uh, attempts to, by the banks to take the pensions of the workers. So I encourage everybody to get a copy, read it, and pass it out. Pass it out to your friends and co-workers. <coughs> the forum this evening has two reports. Um, um, we're going to have two reports. We're going to start off with uh, Larry Holmes, uh, Workers' World Party's first secretary, and PPA movement organizer on building people's power and workers' assemblies, including the October 5th and 6th Detroit Anti-Bankers Assembly and the October 24th National Workers' Demand to Raise Day. After that, we'll hear from Sarah Flounders, who has an eyewitness report from Damascus, Syria, um, and she will give a preliminary talk on a recent trip to Syria as part of a U.S. delegation, an anti-war delegation. So without any further... Um, interruptions. Let's hear from Larry Holmes. Thanks. Oh, wow, we got it up here. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, comrades and friends. Um, I want to I wanna raise two uh, important struggles, and even though they're domestic struggles involving our working class here in the U.S., uh, they're of world significance uh, in some of our opinion. Um, the, the, the first is the situation in Detroit. Now, every city, every town, every locality, you know, every state is under vicious cutback austerity attacks. You know, uh, they're all bad. Some are arguably worse than others. There are a number of cities that are. Uh, have gone bankrupt, uh, which makes their workers and, and oppressed people even more vulnerable to the most vicious kinds of uh, austerity. I, I think just a few days ago, maybe Wednesday, uh, Congress cut food stamps. They cut food stamps by $40 billion over a period of time. And, and this is an attack on workers, by the way, Be, uh, young workers in particular. It's an attack on everybody, but I think particularly they were aiming at, at workers between the age of 18 and 40, uh, which will, if this is approved, find it very difficult to get even the pittance of food stamps that some of them you know, might be getting now. But Detroit is a unique situation, comrades. Detroit is enormous in every way, historically, population size, the significance that it plays uh, in this country and the world. It was the heart of manufacturing, and it was a black city. It is a black city. And now it is the first major city in this country, in history, to be forced into bankruptcy by the banks. And this, as you can well imagine, is going to bring an intensive, almost unimaginable attack on our sisters and brothers in Detroit, starting with pensions, but everything else, closing of schools, hospitals, uh, we know the post office situation, which is, which is national. Uh, it is, in many ways, the grease of this hemisphere to a certain extent. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're not analogous, the role that they play either in the continental or global economy. But it, the, the point I'm making is that it's big, and everybody in the ruling class is watching 
how they do this in Detroit, whether they're able to go through with it and whether they're able to violently cut the living standards. For example, in Greece, at a minimum, the living standards of the working class have been cut in half over the last five years. And they're looking at this because it's a test case, because more big cities are going to go bankrupt. And whether or not they go bankrupt, they're still going to be under this savage austerity attack. And if they can bus unions and take away pensions, et cetera, et cetera, in Detroit, they can do it anywhere. And, and you know, for those of you who have a short memory, it, it's funny how the dots, they, they don't seem connected, but these dots are connected. Remember what happened? Uh, what, was, it, was it in November when, you know, all of a sudden, Michigan became a right-to-work state? You think the bourgeoisie didn't have what they're doing now in mind? It's all part of a cumulative, almost systematic attack. Now, our comrades in Detroit and Workers' World Party have taken a bold initiative uh, uh, with discussions with the center. They are holding on the fifth anniversary of the bailout on Wall Street. That's uh, the end of the first week in October. October 5th and 6th, that's a Saturday and Sunday. They're holding an anti-bank assembly against the bailout. And they've written some very compelling educational propaganda and they're getting it out far and wide. And what they hope is that not only will there be attendance locally inside Detroit from union workers, the unemployed, whatever, Occupy Wall Street in, in Michigan, but also outside of the state, in the Midwest, where conditions are very similar, but even more so around the country, even if it's only, you know, uh, symbolic delegations coming from New York and Boston and California, and also to the extent possible, to the extent possible in the time we have, to even get some representatives that are international, you know, from the unions that are struggling in Europe, from Venezuela, you know, and Asia, the Middle East, what, whatever is possible. Uh, this is, I think, a very valiant effort on their part to demonstrate through action that the workers of Detroit need national and international solidarity. We cannot let Detroit be isolated in the same way that the working class in Europe should know, and the union leaders should know better if they do anything that leaves Greece isolated. Because after the Greek working class goes the Spanish working class. After that goes the French working class. And then they go a little north where things are supposed to be a little better, but they're really not, to the German working class, and so forth and so on. We face the same exact situation with Detroit now. The party is going to try to help in every way including sending a strong delegation from New York, from the center. So I, I'm not sure it's on the sign-up sheet. If it's not, I apologize. We'll find a way to compensate for that. But I'd like comrades to think if they can go to Detroit on the weekend of October uh, 5th and 6th. It's an important weekend, and I think as it gets closer, you'll be hearing more and more about the fifth anniversary of the bailout. Some of you who have the time and the stomach you know, to listen to the bourgeois media may have seen the articles and, you know, heard electronic reports about the fifth anniversary of the collapse that led, that, that was a big stage in the development of the global crisis. Well, in a little while, that will be sort of morphing into the fifth anniversary of the bailout. And that's not just the $750 million, billion dollars or so that Congress voted for Wall Street. That's the trillions of dollars literally trillions of dollars that the Federal Reserve has pumped into the financial market over the last five years, you know? So we're going to be saying, bail out the workers of Detroit and not the banks. Now, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Applause sign. Yeah. Um, next Friday, uh, comrades are going to take the podium here and they're going to talk about two things and related things. One of them is the, uh, the AFL-CIO convention, what we did there, what we think of it. Uh, and the other issue is the, the Baltimore Workers' Assembly uh, that I think now is about maybe three weeks old, but 
very, very important. I don't think we've covered it here, and uh, Sharon Black will be here to talk about that and related issues, including October 24th. I want to take a, a minute or two, not too long, to just raise some of the strategical thinking behind what we're proposing, specifically October 24th, which is the 75th anniversary of the, implement, uh, uh, the beginning of the first minimum wage. Actually, the minimum wage was brought into legality a few months earlier, at the end of July of 1938, as part of something called the Fair Labor Standards Act, which was kind of part of the New Deal. But it wasn't implemented until October 24th. That's when, for the first time, it went into effect. And guess what it was? A quarter. It, it was 25 cents. As pickling as that is, actually, a quarter an hour back then, as a minimum wage, was a larger percentage of your average wage for the working class, remember, that was in the middle of the Depression, than 7.25 an hour is now. As a matter of fact, it was probably close to 50%. Whereas, whereas 7.25 is more like a third, and in some instances, even a fourth of uh, what they call the, the median wage. So that's it, it's 75 uh, years old. Earlier this year, some of the unions and some progressives uh, celebrated the 75th anniversary of the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act, and they did things and they had press conferences. But what we're focusing on is the 75th anniversary of its implementation, you know, and, and that's October 24th. What, what are we doing? We are calling for a Raise Workers Wages Day. This became public as a result of it being raised at the Baltimore Workers Assembly on the 1st of September, and they have sent out a call uh, to everybody who wants to do something around this to organize some activity around raising the minimum wage. And, and the key thing, the key demand that they're pushing is the necessity, the urgency for a $15 minimum wage. And uh, they're going to do something in Baltimore. We're already in touch with other branches. We're already in touch with other activists, with other uh, union activists, with other community activists. And I think in a while, you'll see an impressive amount of national activity around this October 24th uh, call. Actually, we were on a phone conference with our comrades and friends in North Carolina, uh, some of whom are actually individually involved in organizing fast food workers, and they're very excited by this. Um, in New York, what the PPA has decided to do is to assemble in Harold Square, 34th Street and 6th Avenue, at, uh, at I think four, between 4 and 5 on Thursday, October 24th. Uh, we could pick many areas, but the reason why we picked Harold Square is because there are low-wage workers everywhere you look. Not only in the fast food restaurants like McDonald's and Wendy's and Pizza Hut uh, and Burger King, but in the retail stores, the big ones like Macy's and the small ones, the closing stores, the jewelry stores, every, everything, the shoe stores, you know, and also in the buildings, you know. The fast food workers are organizing, the Walmart workers are organizing, but they are not the only underpaid workers who are making between minimum wage and 10 or $11 an hour. Security guards, janitors that are not unionized, office workers, everywhere, man, uh, workers who work in manufacturing to the extent there's an, that there's any of that left after what's happened over the past 10 years in the five boroughs. They're also making low, low wages, largely not unionized, no rights, and, and even uh, uh, what makes it even worse is that a lot of these workers need full-time jobs, but they're forced to work, they're forced to work part-time and temporary. So that's why we're going there. And, you know, think about it logistically. We were on 24th Street, that's 34th Street. It makes this office a very good organizing center to go out all around the area. Not that we're just going to limit organizing to this area. That would be bad. We're going to organize all over the, 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 the five boroughs. But just think what we can do in terms of propaganda all around here. And, and, and we should do that. I hope we do that. I want to say this, though. Strategically, the demand for a $15 uh, minimum wage, which is wholly progressive and 
actually much more than what unions are demanding. I think they're demanding $10 and some change or whatever. And, uh, and there was even a minimum wage law that was defeated a few days ago in DC. The, the, and I think it was part of the struggle against Walmarts. I think it was for 1250. What's important about what we're doing is not merely the issue of the minimum wage. We could just as easily be organizing around the demand for full employment. We could just as easily be organizing around another important economic demand that affects hundreds of millions of workers in this country. Right now, it happens to be the minimum wage, which of course is very important. And by the way, a big part of this is also finding a way to support those workers who are already in struggle, like the ones who tried to have a general strike and you know succeeded pretty well given the circumstances uh, on, I think, August 29th. But it's not the issue. That's not the critical point, as important as the issue is. What's important and why we're doing this is because the party has to really appreciate what the capitalist crisis has brought on the working class. It's forcing the working class to take, if it's only baby steps, into a new phase of their development. I call it the phase where we begin massive political organizing of our class. Massive political organizing of our class. This is what the PPA is for. This is what the Workers' Assembly Movement is for. This is what the Assembly Movement is about. You can look at it this way. We have to do the same thing that the AFL-CIO is doing, even though they are hampered by some of their weaknesses. You know, their support for capitalist politics, their uh, ties to the Democratic Party, all these things hold them back. But nonetheless, the most important thing coming out of that convention is, in my view anyway, is their call to open up their ranks as best as they can to workers who are not in unions. And the party has to do the same thing. The party has to be part of that movement. I think that's what the assembly movement is, is about. You know, I hope, I hope that through October 24th in New York, we'll feel strong enough at some point to convene a New York Workers' Assembly, just like they did in Baltimore, and just like some of our comrades and our allies did uh, uh, in, uh, in the South uh, in conjunction with the uh, Democratic National Convention last summer. You remember, they had the Southern Workers' Assembly. And actually, they're having a North Carolina Workers' Assembly tomorrow and Sunday that we'll be participating in. Now, what's the most important change uh, for us, for our branch. I think it's this, in terms of building October 24th here. Social media is great. Texting, downloading, internet, all that stuff, you know, tweeting, but, and, and you could probably reach a lot of people who are active and who are fortunate enough to have access to social media. You could probably reach a lot of them, but we don't want to rely on that. We don't want to rely on that. This time, we want to do our best to get out in the streets and talk to the workers. We've got this initial leaflet, and it will evolve. And I think we're going out tomorrow. And I mean, let me put it this way. As far as we're concerned, what happens on October 24th in, 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 in Herald Square may be important, but it's not as important as what we're able to do before October 24th. I don't think we should get hung up this time. I don't think the reason why we should go out is, oh, October 24th, well, it's, it's got to be big, we're going to be embarrassed, you know. The hell with all that. I think what's way more important is do we use this as an opportunity to break out in a new way, in, in a sense to be reborn and to get out in the streets, not just with posters. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm looking at Comrade Steve over here, and, you know, and I, I heard he said something, and there's a lot of wisdom in it. We'll, we'll be posting up things, but it's very hard to put up posters now. These, uh, uh, the, the, the bankers and the bourgeoisie and these neighborhood improvement associations and renter cops have made it very difficult to put up posters. We'll still do it. 
But it means that in terms of our main weapon, it's going to be leafleting. And bring Workers' World paper. Bring Workers' World paper. Don't worry about people being confused from the People's Assembly to Workers' World. We can live with the confusion. Bring the paper, especially if it's got good articles that address what we're doing, and even if it doesn't. Because the workers need to know it. Why are we keeping it in our office? No one can see it. So getting out, getting out, starting tomorrow is the most important thing. I think that's it, comrades. All the way to October 24th. <laughs> OK. So sisters and brothers, we've all lived through the near war crisis that uh, happened a couple of weeks ago. What happened to that? Uh, the president was on TV practically begging for the right to go to war. And uh, that's all changed, and we're in a new phase. We, we're pretty confident that that's going to happen anyway. In the meantime, we have a report back tonight from um, Sarah Flounders. She's the uh, Workers World Secretariat member and IAC International Action Center co-director. She's just back from Syria. She was there with a the part of a U.S. anti-war delegation that included uh, former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark, former Georgia Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, IAC West Coast Director John Parker, and others. Um, and she's got a very important report to give on that right now. This is, as was described, a preliminary report. Uh, we're just back last night and uh, still evaluating a, a very important trip coming at a very crucial time. Syria is in the midst of an all-out war on many fronts. And you could say that the whole country is a war zone. And that means not only all the cities are targets, every road is a target. And there's no such thing as a civilian area versus a military area. By the U.S. own measures, uh, there's 1,200 of these militia bands, these organized, extremely well-funded mercenaries and thugs from all over the region and wider. And they're being armed, they're being trained in all kinds of equipment use in Jordan and in Turkey. Material is flooding in from Saudi Arabia and many other places. So it's a U.S. orchestrated war And it's important to recognize that <laughs> U.S. imperialism's most effective, most persuasive representative, and I'm talking about President Obama, he really is her, their most effective representative in a generation and more. And yet, he failed on every front to gain support for U.S. war. Failed overwhelmingly in the U.N. Security Council, at the G20 meeting in Moscow, even with NATO or the British Parliament. But most important, with the US Congress, it became impossible to move forward. They, they, they literally couldn't hold the vote because when they counted in advance, they knew it would be a debacle. Every congressional office was flooded and the demonstrations that we had a real role in, in more than 48 cities in the U.S., and in helping to initiate this and reaching out and connecting, was very important. And a role was really played also with the Syrian Americans here in the U.S., who also mobilized. And that's a big and a new development. So Washington was forced to pull back for a time. 
Now, this is also, you could say, a war and a real confrontation that we saw coming long in advance. And two and a half years ago, we were organizing forums and meetings and picket lines and uh, publishing a pamphlet and that, that Joyce Chediak wrote, um, regular articles on what was at stake and who was responsible and that this was an all-out effort at regime change, at destabilization, at U.S. domination of the region. But I really want to spend a lot of time describing the delegation. It's, sometimes it's important to step back and explain why we do the things we do uh, and what role such a trip plays in a view of the anti-war movement. We're opponents of U.S. imperialist wars on every attack of our own ruling class on every front, domestically against racism and repression, internationally, regardless of the country that is being targeted. And every demonstration and picket line and public meeting is really to show opposition and to do so in a way that will unify and encourage others because every war and every attack takes place to isolate and marginalize whoever is the victim of the attack. So the, a delegation to Syria plays the same role, in another sense, as a demonstration, as a picket line. It's, it's a demonstration of solidarity. It's saying Syria is not isolated. It's an attempt to set an example and to confront the demonization of a whole country. It's an attempt to work with the alternative media and also to organize voices within the anti-war movement who are consciously trying to reject the arrogant imperialist demands for regime change. So a great deal of our challenge, it's a political challenge, is to help change the perception of what's at stake, to explain it in ways that people can understand it. Visits to a hospital where, and particularly we, we saw many soldiers who were targets of, of continual snipers attacks. Uh, people wounded from neighborhood defense uh, teams. We visited a, a family displaced persons center. This is a huge social problem in Syria. The the insecurity of war forces whole families to flee with whatever they can carry and they're desperate uh, just to stay together. I mean, what is the insecurity that families have in a time of war? Is how to hold on to everybody and somehow stay together and hold on to each other. That's what security is can be more important than eating and having a roof over your head is to know where your children are, where the elders and the seniors are. Are they taken care of? And so when people flee an area, it's literally what they can put sometimes in a sack, in a bag, squeeze into a car. There are four million internally displaced people in Syria. That's in a population of about 22 million. So it's a huge part of the population. There's about two million refugees outside of Syria, largely in Turkey. Now, one place that's used particularly for the displaced people are schools, because both you're able to guard them and provide security. Very often, each family, or sometimes it's two families, to a classroom, all sharing the bathroom on the hall. It's important because at a school you can provide cafeterias and medical clinics and classrooms because what's most important for the children? That in the disruption of war there's some of that structure and stability that still having classes provides. Singing songs together and being with others of the same age and peer group. So these displacement centers at schools have both forced a number of schools to, to close and others open or move students that might be at that school normally to somewhere where they're traveling further. 
So there's a lot of crowding and doubling up, but it's important to recognize that all the schools and all the classes, all the students in Syria today are in school and classes continue. That's a, that's a big accomplishment. That's a big, big accomplishment. In a society that takes education extremely seriously, education is free in Syria for everyone, and it includes university and medical school and graduate school. But it's the importance of giving structure to the youngest that is taken the most seriously. At this displacement center that we visited, I think almost every family there, a family member had been kidnapped by these roving bands. It's, it's a big source of income for these, these thugs. I mean, it's sort of like open season for anyone in the region to come through who can make money off of ransom, particularly targeted almost anyone who has extended family, who has a job in the Gulf or in the US or in Europe, because they might have someone they could pull on. It's not, it's not necessarily even a political act. If you can snatch a child and force the family or the extended family to ransom back that child or a son or a grandmother, anyone can be a target of the kidnapping, and they are. It's the, the ransom is part of the looting that's going on. We, we couldn't visit the city of Aleppo. It's a major city, it's really the most productive, the industrial center. Uh, for weeks now, Aleppo has been without electricity, without communication, that includes phone or internet, and with the convoys bringing basic food supplies constantly under attack by these rebel forces. Aleppo, extremely important, it's, it's almost right on the Turkish border, and, and these armed groups are able to come in, in trucks, and literally loot entire factories. Not just the goods in the factory, but the equipment, and the communication towers, and the satellite towers, and almost anything that can be taken apart, and it's, it's done even in broad daylight in front of cameras. It's another because it can be sold and resold along with piping and tubing and all manner of, of materials. Now, I at the same time want to say that although we're visiting a country at war, there is every effort and it's a kind of a, it's a discipline, but it's also, also coming from every level to give an impression of calm. Not only are the schools open, the markets are open, the Syria has a, quite a system of very modern roads and highways and very impressive housing, very modern uh, housing. And all of that in, in Damascus in extremely good order. And, and we were told any kind of attack, there's an all-out effort to, like by the very next day, clean it and paint it and give, a, give a, an air of uh, normalcy. That's part of the war, too, to, to not psychologically bend. Uh, we had a very exciting visit to uh, an encampment uh, on Mount Kasayum. This was ta taken, it began on the day that it seemed that the U.S. attack was really, the bombing was going to come that night. And it was hundreds of young people this is the, the mountain that like overlooks all of Damascus and all the communication towers and TV towers and such are on this mountain. So hundreds of youth went up to that mountain and set up an encampment called Over Our Dead Bodies. It, it, it was a human shield and it was really um, a very heroic statement. They'd set up tents and they were determined to stay there during this whole period. And there are hundreds there at any time. Uh, and they have rotations and more than 100 people stay there at night, many hundreds during the day. Uh, young woman who organized it, uh, we were able to do an interview with 
uh, Ogaret Dandash. She was an interesting, actually, a Lebanese uh, woman who had helped to undertake, participated in a similar effort in Libya two and a half years ago. And there were other, we met other young people who had been involved in struggles in Gaza and Mavi Marmar, and shipments when the Palestinians were besieged. It's, it's such an example of internationalism and struggle and struggles learning from each other and linking in together. Uh, it was actually a very interesting exchange because some of the people, for example, Cynthia McKinney, who had been there in Libya, they realized they knew each other. And, um, and also, um, to say, I, I kind of looked up and saw those communication towers and realized, oh my goodness, um, my phone will work here. So <laughs> we were able to do a, an on-the-spot interview um, with this woman, with, with Andrea Sears of WBAI, and they played it by that night. We were able to take that same interview and send it out uh, widely all over the world. Uh, but it was interesting. We thought, well, this is, this is really great. We're going to get this word out um, by tonight, by tomorrow. Uh, but um, actually, by the time we were back off the mountain, I think we weren't even off. Somebody looked on their phone and why the folks up there had already posted it all over Facebook. They were like way ahead of us. So that, that was also an interesting example of um, their ability to communicate. And we, by the way, we told them that this same day, right now, there are demonstrations going on with Occupy Wall Street in New York City that we learned from each other's struggles and from each other's encampments and resistance. And they were very excited to hear about that. Oh, where could we get information? And, you know, so. Um, now, there were also official visits. And I want to take up. Uh, we met with the Syrian president. Bashir Assad, and that's important in terms of standing up to demonization. What does the U.S. demand? It's for regime change, and U.S. imperialism can have the warmest relations with every absolute monarch, every corrupt force in the area, the king of Saudi Arabia and the emirs and the sultans, Absolute dictatorships, no elections whatsoever. And that's considered respectable and fine. When you look at the Gulf states, the majority, there's all these absolute monarchs, and yet the majority of the population are not even citizens. And Syria is the last secular state in the region. So it was an important meeting. We saw it as an important meeting to confront politically the demonization of Syria and their government for the crime of standing up to imperialism. I mean, in essence, that's really the crime, that Syria hasn't caved in. And the central U.S. demand uh, is that President Bashir Assad must resign, must step down, that he lacks legitimacy, and that regime change is the only thing that's acceptable. The U.S. demand is that any future government include these criminal bans that they are directly paying and equipping. And any talks on a negotiated solution revolve around this. Who's legitimate? Who's involved? The U.S. demands that the Syrian government not be involved. And on the other hand, every one of the groups that they represent should be involved. So this is an issue that the movement here can't sidestep. And we're much stronger when we confront it head on. Not a secret meeting. The media was involved. They sent out pictures right away. So it was publicly covered. And anything that we did in Syria publicly covered. It's not secret. 
It turned out it was the same day, actually, that Fox News was giving big coverage to an interview between former Congressman Dennis Kucinich and President Assad. <coughs> And, and actually Kucinich was, was there in Damascus at the same time that we were. So that was also important. We also had meetings with the Grand Mufti of Syria, which is the Sunni's highest religious leader, who strongly for respect for all religious groupings. It's important because of the way in which uh, particularly Saudi Arabia has attempted to use uh, the Sunni forces within Syria, who are almost 80% of the population, and distort the issue, um, and distort it in religious ways. So the Grand Mufti of Syria plays a very important role, so much so that his son was assassinated because he refused to side with the Saudi view. And he was denied a U.S. visa. He was, he was scheduled to come here this summer in a whole series of meetings with religious leaders here, Christian and Jewish and Muslim, to talk about the mosaic that makes up Syria and the importance of respect for all religions. And was assured that his visa would come through. He went to Jordan to get it and it was directly stopped from the highest levels. It had been authorized in, in Jordan. We met with the leaders of the, actually the oldest Christian church in, in Damascus, a church dating back to the second century, now a Greek Orthodox church. The Christian population in Syria is about 10 to 12 percent. It's a very important minority uh, that sees itself directly threatened and very often targeted by this war. Now, The very fact and the idea of sending such a delegation to Syria, it will be attacked and will be baited and will be criticized in various ways. We can expect that. It goes with the terrain, shouldn't be bowled over by it. And especially by opponents who are part of the imperialist effort to keep Syria isolated. And our message is simply that Syria is not isolated that there are countries and movements around the world that defend Syria from imperialist attack, and that includes even here in the imperialist center. And, and this is why our visit was also timed as a way of participating in a very important conference in Beirut the day before we went into Damascus. It was called the Arab International Forum Against U.S. Aggression on Syria and for Resistance. And it was or organized by uh, the Arab International Center for Communications and Solidarity. Oh, my time is running. Um, this forum in D.C. was, uh, it, it opened with representatives of the Lebanese movement, including Hezbollah, and then with George Galloway from Britain and Ramsey Clark, the U.S., and the ambassadors of Russia and Lebanon and Syria and Nicaragua and Iran, and movements throughout Europe and the Middle East. From the U.S., there were representatives there from ANSWER and UNAC and the International Action Center. And there were strong resolutions put forward. And then from the conference, our small delegation, which was Ramsey Clark, Cynthia McKinney, John Parker from the west coast of the International Action Center, myself from here in New York, and Daydan Kamathi, who's with the All African People's Revolutionary Party in LA. And he also has an important program on KPFK Pacifica. And we're also joined by Johnny Achi from Arab Americans for Syria in Damascus. The invitation to, to go to Syria came from Syrian Americans. We've worked with in demonstrations and educational forums. The tickets were through travel agency in Los Angeles and paid for by Syrian American doctors and others in the Syrian American community here. I, I say all this because it always comes up as a kind of a backhanded attack that we want to explain that this is part of the movement here, making a political statement and refusing to be isolated. 
Now, I just want to, in closing, touch a bit on the situation here, because now, because since what, what seemed the very eve of war, and if anybody who watched President Obama's talk there <coughs> that night, you didn't know if the aircraft had already taken off or not, given the, the tone of it. Uh, it's been made very clear at the UN Security Council, very publicly stated by Secretary of State Kerry, that military devastation of Syria is still absolutely on the table. And it seems the height of arrogance after this, but they're still demanding that any resolution on Syria at the UN Security Council approve military measures if Syria doesn't meet US demands and timeline and inspection lines in exactly the way the US wants. So they want a resolution that has, is really a war resolution. It's unlikely they'll get it, but we should ask why they're doing it, especially this week as the UN is back in session. And it's very important, anytime there's a big international meeting, you could look at it, there's always a crisis where US imperialism is threatening war. And that becomes the terms of debate. And that's what's going on now. The UN is in session this week. And it's an effort to really dominate all debate with charges against Syria. And that's really a way of also deflecting any discussion of the criminal US role, who on earth is organizing the effort to overthrow the government of Syria? The US, of course. But by making every discussion be on gas attacks, which even as the UN report shows, there's no way to confirm such an attack, where it came from, who's responsible for it, Sarin gas, we should remember the biggest sarin gas attack was a suitcase in a subway in Tokyo by a, a small sect some, some years back. It takes very little in terms of technology to spread gas. So this is really an effort while the UN is in session that the only topic of discussion is this war. And it's an old, old tactic. As I say, pulled out before almost every international meeting to create a crisis and then demand that every country align themselves with the world masters. And it's a kind of a tattered old script. Will it be effective? We don't think it's likely to be. But we should take the danger and the threat seriously. Now, we hope through this delegation that will be followed with articles interviews, meetings, encouraging others to act and speak and write and keeping this on the front. I think a big impression that we all came back from Syria with is the way in which at every level religious groups, community groups, teachers, doctors, there's acting with an air of confidence and determination. And it's a good lesson that we also act with confidence in our resistance to imperialist domination and confidently stating that no country can or should be isolated. And also acting with confidence that this is a new period the anti-war movement, even when you think of the allies in the Syrian American community, and almost every major city. Now, that didn't happen. It reflects part of the changing character, even of the population here in the US. You think back to the Vietnam War, but in the war on Iraq or on Libya, that didn't exist in the same force, where there were hundreds and hundreds of Syrian Americans coming out and mobilizing and taking part in the demonstrations. That's significant, and we thank them. Arab Americans for Syria, the Syrian American Forum, and many, many other groups we want to take recognition of the importance of the demonstration that took place in Washington, D.C. on the day Congress came back 
right in front of the White House. And that have taken place, whether in Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Detroit, Allentown, PA, where there's actually the largest Syrian American community in the country. And we also <coughs> want to act with great confidence because this is a new period in another way that before the U.S. launched a war, there was opposition on such a scale, I mean, larger even than could be reflected in the demonstrations, when congressional offices said, we're being besieged a thousand to one. When Nancy Pelosi announced, well, I intend to vote for war, but 95% of my constituents are telling me not to. That's, yeah. that's important. Because it was happening all over. And it gives us great potential to link this war and this is something that we did in all of the media and interviews, and we had many, many interviews in Syria. They wanted to hear what, what do people from the U.S. say, what do they think. We could talk about the struggle here is for jobs and for health care and for schools right here, and that's what's destroyed in another war. That as Martin Luther King said, the bombs that fall in Vietnam fall here. It's even more so true today because this is a system in such crisis. So saying that again and again here and there is a real message that was deeply appreciated there and it certainly resonates here in the U.S. Thank you. Okay, thanks um, Larry and Sarah. Um, we're going to go to discussion. Before that, we have a brief announcement. Um, there's going to be a justice march for Haitian cholera, cholera victims on September 26th. Um, the UN is in session now, um, and this will be a protest uh, because of the invitation of the cholera virus by the misnamed UN Stabilization Mission. Um, 8,300 people in Haiti have died from cholera, 700,000 are infect, infected, and this demonstration is happening um, September 26th from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. at 47th Street and 1st Avenue in front of UN headquarters. There will be a press conference at 3 p.m. We would like to encourage comrades and friends to go, show us solidarity with the Haitian people, and especially the cholera victims. Uh, before we have our discussion, we need to talk about money. <clears throat> we all m know money doesn't grow on trees. There's no gold coins dropping on the ground like hailstones. We're funded by pledges and donations from our members and friends and the Workers' World Supporter Program. The funds we collect pay for the day-to-day -day ex expenses for our office, mailings, phones, paper, placard board, copies, many other necessities. As the basket gets passed around, is it getting passed around? Okay, thank you, Lynn. Lynn's passing it around. Please give as generously as you can and also see Ellen immediately after the meeting to hand in pledges. It's also possible to make credit card, card donations and you can see Ellen to set that up. Okay, <clears throat> Workers' World Party has a long history of encouraging as much inclusion as possible during the general discussion Following our reports, while we welcome everyone's comments and questions, we especially welcome people of color, women, and LGBTQ people to add their voices to the discussion. We're asking everyone to be disciplined and stick to the three minute time limit for your comments and questions. Sharon will hold up a sign letting you know when your time is up. Um, sticking to the three minute limit shows solidarity with the meeting and enables everyone to have time and feel comfortable making comments and questions. And the floor is now open for discussion. Okay, comrade. Sahid? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Shahid Kamran, and I'm a Secretary General of Pakistan USA Freedom Forum and a part of the movement against war and aggression to any country. 
Thank you very much, Larry and Sarah Founder. Larry mentioned this thing that we should have to take a stand in the war against the poor, and especially now the food stamps. That trend shows that was where our government is going. So this is our job to take a stand. Sarah, you make us very much proud, and really, I hope the people know the real face of the U.S. citizen who's standing for the peace, and you as the representative led by the Wednesday Clark and other great Americans and the European people who love the war, against the war and standing for the peace. Only one question I have, when you met the president of Bashar al-Assad, how do you feel that, do they have any idea regarding about the talking to their people and groups to settle down the problem? 13% Shia, Alawis, and the 60 more than percent Sunnis. So is there any sense you got that they have any plan to solve this problem? Because we are, same way when we are against aggression, the same way we are standing for the people of the citizen, they should have to choose their own government. Thank you very much. Okay, Thea. Um, I just want to say that both report backs are really good and really important to think about. Um, my one question that I've been kind of baffling in my head, and I hope Sarah can answer, is in regards to speaking to the people and um, Bashar al-Assad, um, you know, with the idea of handing over um, like their weapons that they have and the agreement that's going on. Um, I know that you know some people here feel like you know it's something to worry about. It's something like like Libya, um, while some Syrian Americans that I know feel like it is like Libya and what will happen if they do that. And I was wondering if you encountered anyone that talked about it or even the president himself and what they see for the future. Thanks. Michael? Comrades, I just want to give an example of solidarity that Michael Hi, Chair. You know, if you read the uh, corporate media, and um, it's like main spokesman, the New York Times, they'll always refer to like Syria being isolated and uh, all by itself, except for maybe Russia and Iran and maybe China. But there is tremendous international solidarity with Syria. And um, particularly in Latin America, where um, we know what happened to President Mor uh, Morales of Ecuador, of uh, Bolivia, where his plane uh, was denied the uh, ability to fly over France and had to make an emergency landing in Austria. Most recently, just the other day, President Maduro of Venezuela his plane was denied the ability to fly over Puerto Rico on an official trip to China. So, um, with, all, with all those insults, um, there, on the other hand, there's tremendous solidarity um, with Syria and the Syrian people. I uh, recently saw a very militant demonstration in La Paz, Bolivia, in solidarity with Syria. And discussions in La Paz about they, they know what's going on. You know these places are not isolated anymore. But there's also militant solidarity. And a great example is Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela, a big oil producer, and um, in Syria, for the most part, there's no central heating uh, in the winters, which can be cold. People have individual units in each room, or it's on wheels, and can move it around. And it takes a certain type of um, fuel, petroleum, uh, and that is also manufactured in Venezuela. And last winter, the winter before, it's you know cold in Syria. It's raw, biting wind. And uh, both winters, Venezuela sent their own oil tankers to uh, from Venezuela to Syria to deliver oil so that Syrian people would be cold in the winter. And we, we should also particularly salute the workers on those ships because that was a dangerous voyage. You have to cross the Atlantic 
and then uh, go from one end of the Mediterranean to the other, the Mediterranean being almost like Lake NATO, with the U.S. and, and NATO warships all over, air, aircraft all over, yet that ship determinedly sailed to the port of Latakia, unloaded oil, and returned to Venezuela. So um, we should, you know, thank the workers who were on that ship and thank the Venezuelan people for the sacrifice of sending oil to uh, Syria. the timeliness of this trip. I think it was uh, great that they went when they did, and also that they were able to get this interview uh, from the youth encampment up on Mount Cassium onto U.S. radio through WPAI and from there onto the internet uh, with that very same night. And there's a particular reason I say it's timely, and I'm not even sure that uh, Sarah would know about this because she would have already have been in Syria. The day before they went and met the young people up on the top of Mount Kassim, the front page article of the New York Times, which shows you that the thrust for a war is not over at all, was all about how there were unnamed experts. Who knows where they're from? I mean, even from the United States, who, no, they don't say who they are or whatever, who are saying that, oh, it was Mount Cassium was where the rockets were fired from with the poison gas. Now, this is where all the television and, uh, and other communications stuff is. They were making it sound like it was the Pentagon up there. And there may be, I'm sure there's military stuff there too. But, you know, are we supposed to believe that the Syrians are so stupid that they would fire from their main headquarters yeah. rockets with poison gas when that's the thing that, that was supposed to be the, the tipping point you know, for the U.S. Uh, and, and that it could be traced back to them? That, that, that they say that these rockets, you know, that they have so, some kind of an angular way of tracing it back. Anyway, the most important thing is they're acting as though there's proof. They all talk about it as though there's proof. Nobody's seen this proof. No, nobody. Now that no, no members of Congress have seen it, nobody has seen it. You just are supposed to take their word for it. Well, I'll tell you, at this point, after Iraq, after yeah. Libya, after people around the, and Afghanistan, people around the world are not going to say, oh, yeah, we'll take your word for it. We believe you. We must be right. They're going to say, this is a lot of bullshit. <laughs> Um, really great reports. In terms of what Larry raised about the Detroit, the important uh, Detroit anti-banker, anti-austerity assembly, um, as Larry pointed out, we're really trying to build as much solidarity for this important tribunal assembly as possible from around the country. And if comrades and friends are interested in going to Detroit, for October 5th and 6th. Please let Larry, either Larry or myself know. We're trying to organize transportation to go, all kinds of transportation to go. Whether you want to help build for the event or participate in the event, because August, I mean, I'm sorry, October 5th is mainly going to be about the crisis in Detroit and around, I'm sure, Michigan as well, because it's not just Detroit, it's Michigan has been devastated, although Detroit is the epicenter of that devastation. Uh, but on Sunday the 6th is going to be a lot of international and national solidarity, you know, tying in the struggle, the capitalist economic crisis in Detroit, in this country, and around the world. So they really want as much solidarity as possible. And even if you can't go, if you want to send a message of solidarity from your organization, um, we're gonna be gonna, they're going to be doing videotape of, you know, uh, leaders of different struggles, whether it's North Carolina or the West Coast or whatever. You know, please let us know, because that's all part of the solid building the solidarity, which is, as Sarah was pointing out, and Larry, the solidarity 
is so, so important both in this country and around the world because we know what type of system we live under, which is about divide and conquer, to keep the bosses you know, in power, on top, uh, and repressing the working class and the oppressed on the bottom. And I just want to say this about what Sarah raised about Syria, which is so important. I really hope that we can organize as many meetings around the country with the, the video and all of the eyewitness testimony, because I think it's so true that the whole, it, it's, it's a political sea tra change going on, because people are tired of war. They're tired of war. People are realizing that there's a war against them. It's a, it's a war against their, uh, their living standards. I mean, this thing with the food stamps, even though it's the House that passed you know, these $40 billion in cuts of, in food stamps over the next 10 years, and the Senate still needs to vote, the fact that it even passed just really shows the, the, the stain in, that, that the politicians, the capitalist politicians have for our class. You know, and, and Deirdre wrote a really great article about the growing income gap between, you know, the rich and poor. I mean, this is what it, this is, you know, this is uh, symptomatic of that. And even the GIs are against any type of attack on Syria. The Navy Times, two thirds of the GIs came out against it. I mean, that's part of our class, too. You know, that's incredible. How can we reach these GIs and help, you know, Organize them is, is so important. I'm sure they really wish they could be part of any type of organized resistance against it. So um, anyway, I really hope we can get the word out about this, this important, important delegation. I just wanted to ask Sarah if she could just share any, any of the, um, you know, the words of encouragement that President uh, Assad shared with the delegation. I mean, how did he feel about you know, the delegation coming there. The fact that he even met with the delegation says a lot. But I'm just wondering if you can share any type of words that they shared with, with the delegation. I think that, and even with the, the leader of the, um, uh, of the religious um, grouping that you, you know, yeah, that you, you met with. I think, you know, any type of sharing of that information, I think would be really great to hear. Um, those were really good reports, and um, I'm so proud of Sarah and John and our comrades and, and Ramsey and all the people who went to Syria. And I was worried, you know, the night that they got there, they were going to bomb, you know, and I thought, those are my brave comrades. Those are people who understand anti-imperialism. The Deirdre's comment reminded me of something, and also Michael, because in 2002, there was a movie made about the attempted coup against Hugo Chavez. And in the process of this movie, which is called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, it's a wonderful movie, there's a part where the people of Venezuela are interviewed and they all say, no, we don't listen to the mainstream media, we don't believe in it, it's, uh, we, no, it has nothing to do with us. It's all run by the rich people and has nothing to do with us. And I remember thinking in 2002 when I saw this movie, oh, I wish that we were like that here. You know, that would be really nice if people felt that way. And I feel that right now that is how people feel. I feel that right now people are very, very skeptical. There is a thing that the FBI has just come out with. It says now that you, they are going to be suspicious of people who don't accept the 9-11 story. And then they did a little report on this and they said it turns out they found that 48% of the people in this country are suspicious of the 9-11 story. <laughs> And it's kind of funny, and people were very upset. Oh my God, that's terrible, I know so many people. But the fact of the matter is, this shows you, this skepticism is big, because that's just one part. That's the 9-11 story. There's all kinds of other skepticism, like how can the, the, you know, the Congress say that they're not gonna give you know, food to poor babies and old ladies? I mean, there's something really bizarre about that, and people know it. And all the, the threats of war, people are quite conscious that there's something wrong, 91% of the people opposed the war before they even knew too much about it. So I think what we have is a very, very significant thing, and also I, I caught that thing about how the soldiers and the Navy, they don't want to be in this the, a war there either, and the United States is supposedly mustering 20,000 
men from someplace close to go over there. So the boots on the ground, somebody said they're gonna wear Nikes. But the fact is that it's going, it's really a very, very serious problem for the ruling class because everybody is not lined up like ducks in a row. We are s skeptical, we are suspicious, and we're t pissed off. And the fact of the matter is the FBI can't do a goddamn thing about it. Because in fact, the more they do, the more skeptical people will be. participated in the second anniversary of OWS a couple of days ago. Um, uh, first of all, there was a series of activities that day, and there was an important demonstration in the morning outside of McDonald's in solidarity with the fast food workers. And we, we participated in a really great demonstration, part of which was to go inside and give roses to the workers. And, um, and Sahai and other people, we, we might checked, and it was um, many other OWS people came. It initially, it started at 8 a.m., but it was really great. I mean, it was a great activity. And then after that, there, were, um, there was a press conference, and we were able, actually, we had made this big banner that said, on the second anniversary of OWS, solidarity with underpaid workers. And it was signed, uh, the People's Powers Assemblies. And we, we were able, actually Alex and other people held it up for a really long time, which was backbreaking during this press conference, but we made it on New York One and other channels um, with, with our banner because we held it up at this press conference for a very long time. Um, then we participated in a, in a march from, um, from Zuccotti Park up to Washington Square Park, and then there was another demonstration, mostly of union workers, um, at the end of the day from Doug, uh, that started at Doug Hamishal Plaza. So we, the point of all of this is that it, it was very good, but we, we sort of came out that day with the demonstration that's going to be on uh, October 24th, which is the, the march to raise the minimum wage. And um, the response was, we, we didn't even have, I mean, it was really, really the initial flyer. So we didn't even have where it was going to be or what time it was going to be. It just said to be announced. But uh, we got out about 800 flyers, and the response was really great. I mean, I, I put out, I sent this out in an email, and I apologize if people heard this already. But it was interesting because both the OWS people and movement people and regular workers, everybody, the response was great. I mean, it was like um, this issue of it being the second anniversary, I mean, uh, that it's the 75th anniversary of the, the minimum wage it really struck a chord, I think, particularly with the, um, the more movement people, that we're doing something on this anniversary to demand a raise in the minimum wage. But also, you know, there were these union workers at the demonstration at five o'clock, you would think, well, what's, what's the big deal about raising the minimum wage to them? But, but it was really, they, they thanked us. In fact, a person came the next night to the meeting that we had here. So, I just think that um, we really need to get, as Larry said, we really need to get out with this leaflet. I mean, anybody you see, the guy that stands out in front of the stores leafleting, you know, how all these stores, whether it's Rite Aid or whatever, who's standing out there and they're totally underpaid, probably the worst of anybody. But, you know, getting, when you're walking down the street, giving the flyers to those people. As we were marching from, um, from Zuccotti Park to Washington Square, there were all these workers hanging out the door, you know, and we were able to give flyers to them. So I just think this has tremendous potential, really, really tremendous potential. And we want to also start tomorrow. So we're going to go out tomorrow and um, do some leafleting. There are several events going on tomorrow, but that we're also going to try going out on the trains. Um, some of us have done that a lot before. Ann Pruden and I have done it a lot. And, and I had this idea about doing the trains, which was like, um, talking too long. <laughs> so, um, you know, sometimes when you do it on the train, you sort of give a talk at, at one part, but people can't hear you all the, at the end of, end of the train, so you sort of have to say it again. But I was thinking that we could do like a mic check, <laughs> the two people. 
so that you know you say it and the other person says it at the end and then you have a third person with you that gets the names of the people who are interested. So you sort of have a three person team to go on the, on the trains. And I think that it's going to be really easy. I was a little nervous, of course, at the beginning of the day whether we would get a great response, but we really did. So I, I hope, and also I wanted to mention one other thing, which is that Teresa is in contact um, with a union organizer. Um, I forget which union it is, but they are trying to organize um, the workers at Bed Bath & Beyond. And so we're planning, actually, between now and October 24th to have like a street meeting and an activity outside of Bed Bath and Beyond. That's a you know it's a building activity, but it's really just as important. So, anyway. Yes. So, so tomorrow we're going to start at one o'clock. So people can come here at one o'clock, and if not, if you want to just take flyers on their on your own, um, this flyers. It's been this is still an initial flyer. It's been translated into Spanish, but this was from the older flight, so it's a work in progress. <laughs> oh. Hey, your comrades, um, I forgot to thank the, um, the delegation who actually went to Syria and Clark and everyone uh, for their tremendous work and their intervention and um, put forth a stand of the workers and the anti-war movement here. Uh, on the 29th of um, August, uh, the fast food workers, who are workers who are being paid property wage, actually intervened in imperialist war by calling a strike. When imperialists want to have, uh, when, when imperialists and the capitalists want to attack the workers here further, the first thing they do, and what they always try to do, is to go and have a war abroad. And these workers through that strike and the workers who are being paid the lowest actually intervened on that. We fathered, the workers in the community fathered the intervention by a delegation that we was able to send out to the AFL-CIO convention in LA. We were able to reach out to ASME workers who actually passed a very strong resolution saying the workers is not going to fight this war. The Taxi Drivers Alliance, Workers Alliance, who spoke on immigration, who are these taxi workers who don't have any benefits or retirement, spoke on the question of what pension meant to everyone and only 11% of the workers get pension and that they support the low paid workers' right to um, benefits and so forth, but they also spoke out against the war in Syria. This is someone who was affiliated of the AFL-CIO. It wasn't AF, this was one of the affiliate group of the 600 delegates that was led and community group that was brought to the convention. The Obama administration announced that they will attend the AFL-CIO convention. Through these workers' initiative, through uh, the, the, um, the low-wage workers, and through the whole movement in which Sarah and Larry spoke about tonight, the, the cuts in food stamps, the unrest in every walk of life, Obama couldn't come to that conference. He couldn't come because he wasn't assured by that conference that he would get the endorsement of the workers to go to war. That would have been a decisive blow. We were able to intervene with our statement from Workers' World to the leadership and to the delegate and got an incredible response. So with all this effort, it shows you that we rose to the table and we should follow this with a struggle with Tony just got through speaking of, of going to the workers on the subways, in the parks, uh, up and down the street. This is how we're gonna do it. And like Larry says, taking every worker's world with you, because there's no contradiction in what we're saying in that paper and what the workers need to be dealing with. Thank you.
Community Labor United, I don't know the rest. Postal Jobs and Services. For Postal Jobs and Services. Um, are going to speak too. We'll also be speaking. And so this is a very important struggle. Um, there's a free outdoor screening Monday at Diversity Plaza, Jackson Heights, Queens, 7.30, about the story of uh, uh, Dr. Afia Siddiqui, um, a, a casualty of the so-called War on Terror. Uh, she's imprisoned for life, framed up, um, and this is a free outdoor screening in Jackson Heights at Diversity Plaza, 7.30, Monday night. 74th Street and Broadway, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, Jim. Oh, it's, let's get you the let's get you mic'd up. From an activist in Ireland who actually said that they had she spread the link the uh, link of Sarah's sound talk. Um, through her contacts in Ireland, but they had trouble reaching the link and she wanted to know how to keep the link going and something like that. There was also an email from an uh, activist of an uh, anti-war group in Hamilton that's very active, and they wanted to congratulate the uh, delegation, say how great it was, but then say, hey, we have this person who's been on the, the people who stand in front, like in Gaza, in front of the bulldozers and stuff like that. And if you have another one, please invite her to go too, but that type of thing. So those are just a couple small examples. There's also an interesting email from um, a Japanese labor federation that uh, represents three main uh, labor organizations in Japan. I don't really understand the whole thing too much. They're having a big action November 4th, but they listed a whole bunch of labor in action around the world, including uh, the ILWU's uh, effort on the West Coast and uh, several other things. Comrades, anybody else? Is that it? Okay. Um, Sarah, would you like to come up and make some closing comments? I'm sorry? No. And Larry? Sure. Uh, sure. Try to be brief. You know, j just on the Syria crisis and, you know, this tremendous trip that we made, you know, it may seem as though it's all died down, you know, with the deal and so forth. But this is an ongoing crisis. It's not going away. And it could flare up like that. As a matter of fact, we predict it will. We don't know whether it's tomorrow or whether it's the middle of October, but uh, you can bet whatever you can bet that it will flare up, It'll probably be before 2014, you know. So uh, uh, if you want to push it on the back burner for a half an hour, okay. But don't push it too far back because you're going to need to grab it. And uh, I hope we come up with, I mean, the tour is a nice idea, but I, I hope we come up with some imaginative and timely ways of, uh, of, 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 of using the trip and everything else that we've done uh, to uh, erect a bigger platform, you know, to, to deepen the anti-imperialist message and to rally the anti-imperialist forces. Um, uh, on, uh, on the uh, unfairly paid workers' struggle, one thing is important, I think, to, uh, to make clear at this juncture we are not trying to rival the unions that are pioneering, uh, if I could use that term, in, uh, in trying to organize um, uh, uh, underpaid workers uh, under circumstances that are very difficult. And, 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 and those of you who know anything about this, it, for, for, for decades, uh, the unions have stayed away from trying to organize McDonald's. Uh, and Walmarts because they felt it was, for various reasons, they felt it was impossible. Now the crisis is forcing them to do that because they're losing the so-called union wage jobs. So they have no other choice but to turn to the, the swelling ranks of uh, underpaid workers 
many of whom are people of color and women and immigrants, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're not trying to rival them. You know, uh, what we are trying to do is open up another front. And that's important. Why? Because it's not, well, it should be SEIU's uh, uh, responsibility, but they're not able to do it. Uh, that's one of the groups that's, that they're, they're responsible for fast food forward. Uh, UFCW, United Food and Commercial Workers, they're the union that's primarily organizing our Walmart. They're doing, from what we can tell, a good job with the workers. But they're not taking on organizing public support on a worker-to-worker, -worker, community community basis. And you have to ask yourself, why should it just be those workers in the fast food restaurants and in the big box retailers who are fighting this? I mean, the, the, the issues, every issue, the low wages, the, the, the lack of organization, the harassment, the pensions, uh, 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 health care, it affects all of us. But no one is saying to the workers anywhere, even though you don't work at a fast food restaurant, even though you don't work at Walmarts or any of the other box stores, this is your struggle. E even if you are fortunate enough to have a job that, you know, pays you 20 or $30 an hour, which is no big deal, especially here in New York. Or you're fortunate enough to have retired and they haven't stole your pension yet, you know, or, or, or you know, cut back your Social Security. In other words, whatever your circumstances are, you should have a way to demonstrate your solidarity with these brave low-wage workers who are fighting a tremendously uphill battle. The unions so far, as far as we can tell, are not providing that. So one of the things that we're doing with October 24th, you know, Day of Solidarity with you know, underpaid workers, is we're trying, if only on a small scale, maybe a little bigger than we think, not just here but other ways, we're trying to provide a way for everybody who wants to, to come out regardless of where you work or whether even you have a job or not, you know? And uh, I mean, you know, already we've excited some people even though we haven't got the work out. The best elements in Occupy Wall Street are already with this. You know, uh, uh, just to echo a little bit of what Tony said about uh, our, our protest in front of McDonald's 8 a.m., you know, on the 17th of September, what was not only uh, a noteworthy, you know, was the effect we were having, the size of the demonstration and how it built, but also how fearful the police and the bosses are about this effort to organize these workers. They had police by the dozens outside and inside. It was tense. It was like a lockdown, really. And they had, when you went inside McDonald's, every worker had a manager behind them just because we were having a quiet, peaceful demonstration demanding the rights of these workers to a higher wage. It was incredible to fear, you know, which, which speaks to something else, too. And, and, and it's, it's, another, it's another point, you know, that we need to be clear about when we say we're not trying to do what the union's doing yet. Maybe at another point, we can, you know, we can cross that bridge, that is, send people into some of these places. And there are activists who are doing that, you know. But right now, we're trying to create a vehicle for those, both for the workers themselves at these places, but also for those whose circumstances are not that, but want to show that they're in support of, of, of these workers. It's a challenge for us to really figure out how to do this the right way. Number one. We can't just barge into every fast food restaurant yelling, you know, <laughs> these are workers' jobs. You know, we don't, I mean, they're already fearful. They're brave and they're standing up. But you know, they're replaceable. They know that. So we, I mean, our, our, our goal is not to go in there and go crazy and, and, and get people in trouble or go well, go way beyond where the workers are at. The workers are probably at different places depending on where you are in terms of their confidence and their militancy. Actually, this is the benefit of this, comrades. By doing this, we find out. We find out where there's confidence and where it's moved to the next level. And we also find out where it's very incipient and, you know, 
And we do that with sensitivity and care. This, this is important lessons. This is important. I mean, if you don't want to organize the workers and you want to be up here, that's okay. But if you want to sort of engage them, you know, at some point, these things are important to you. You know, uh, I, just getting back to the, you know, the best elements in OWS, you know, we're working very close with the leadership of a group called uh, Occupy Evolve. And in a way, <laughs> that means Occupy Evolve into the working class, you know. Uh, these are African-American people, I mean, at least the leadership. And at tonight, tonight, they are meeting at OWS's, you know, meeting headquarters, 60 Wall Street. They're having a meeting about October 24th. Not our meeting. We didn't ask them to do it. We didn't even know they were doing it, I think, until we got an email about it. They set up, they set up their own Occupy webpage for October 24th with their own texts, and they're having their own organizing meeting tonight at 60 Wall Street. We didn't even know about it. This is great. This is great. We couldn't go because we, we got our own meeting. But, you know, I think it's really important that we see this as a, as a change, a cultural change, or at least try, even if it's not 100%, 50 or 60%. What I was saying about, you know, comrades not feeling like, oh, Larry, somebody else is telling us we've got to go out on Saturday. No, no, all right, I don't know. Well, maybe not, maybe next Saturday. And like it's sort of drudgery or whatever. I try to look at it another way. Look at it as a new opportunity to find out what the hell the workers are thinking, to confirm what you think or find out that what you think in some instances is not necessarily true. How else do you do it? I mean, we can all argue with each other in here, in this room, until we go nuts. But <laughs> if you're not out there talking to the workers and, and sort of bringing in something new, some new, in, but, but, you know, other than our brilliant, experienced minds and whatnot, if you're not doing that, it, it'll help the argument at least, you know. In, in, in that vein, I hope comrades look at the, the leaflet, which will constantly change. Because this is something, it doesn't have to be this leaflet. The damn leaflet can change. You can hand out three leaflets, in addition to them being, you know, translated into several languages that are important here in the metropolitan area. I mean, it, I know the comrades in the, in the labor fraction. I want them to think about it. What, what, what other angle do you want to raise? Think of all the arguments that the bosses use against us. You can't raise the minimum wage because you lose jobs. You know, so it's either jobs or wages. You got to make a choice. It's it's a great argument. You know, who's going to take that on in a piece of literature? What what about you know the comrades in fists or or, or our, our other friends? May first. This is a situation where there's no there's no strategic upside to just having one leaflet saying one thing. Some some literature may be more advanced, may be more anti-capitalist. And some literature may be more basic. And I'm saying this, it, this time, maybe not every time, but this time, uh, given that we are at the beginning of a new stage in the development of our working class, this is a good idea. Let me start with uh, what Larry was just talking about, because it's really what we do in the struggle right here that is of the utmost importance and is a real test. And just as what we're talking about on Syria, we can be a small force and a spark and a force of mobilizing others by the way we take up an issue. The same thing is true with October 24th, or the struggle against the banks in Detroit. How, how do you focus the attention of the movement here? The, the same thing we've been trying to do with People's Power Assemblies, whether in Baltimore or any other city or right here. So it's, it's extremely important how we're working with others, 
because we're not a force alone. It's what's done in coalitions and to bring an idea alive. And we, I think we want to give a lot of attention to both Detroit and, and what's being attempted there and, and really think through what we can do here for October 24th. Because unless you're out in the streets, you don't. Sometimes the only way to really look at a piece of literature is if you're giving it to someone else and then you're kind of seeing it through other eyes. Um, and I also want to say a lot about this sign that we have hanging up here. Stop the wars on Syria and black youth. Because making that link that there's a war here that's every single day and is deeply felt and, and whether it's stop and frisk or whether it's the police shootings or, or whether it's a, an attack on food stamps, there's no shame. There is no shame and there is no limit to what they're willing to destroy and take back. I mean, food stamps, that is sustenance. That is like the ability to eat. And they cut $40 billion out of it over a period of, I mean, they, they'd spend that in a few days in a war. It's not that it's not there. So that really is the war here and the war there. And making that link, if we're not making that link, it's really not real. Uh, now, I wanted to address a couple of things about back on Syria, about how regional this war is. Um, I'm sitting there in this Marriott Hotel in Beirut, waiting for the conference to start. And because it was kind of early morning, I was just having coffee sitting in the lobby, right by the front doors. I was speaking to an Arab woman. Um, Actually, it was a, the daughter of France Fanon. But anyway, we're, so, so we're having coffee sitting there, and she pointed to the group who was sitting almost next to us, I mean, right by the front door, but it was about seven um, young men, very large. Any one of them looked like they would be a bouncer at a club, dressed kind of rough, and each of them with a big canvas satchel sitting next to them. Um, and she said, see those guys right there? They're from Chechnya. They're all on their way in. You'll see it. Their, their ride is coming to, somebody will come by and pick them up just a little bit. It was true. It was true. So when I say that there's recruiting throughout the whole area descending into Damascus and how open the borders are and how openly it takes place. I mean, this is the Marriott in Beirut. Um, we should just be aware of what is flooding the area and it endangers Lebanon also. It endangers not only Syria. It, it, um now, will they succeed? They, they put quite an effort into organizing uh, a whole group in Jordan, the CIA, uh, just last week, and someone was describing um, they didn't get past a few miles inside the border um, when they were dealt with. So this is a struggle. It's a military struggle. It's a political struggle. The, the level of U.S. arms is increasing and the sophistication of them. There's, it was described to us both heat-seeking weapons, um, also even weapons that are attached to motion detectors, so even th that, that the U.S. is giving these forces. Now, um, I, just to answer some of the questions that were asked, um, in terms of uh, the meeting with, with President Assad, there was one very interesting part. Now, um, Bashir Assad was, was really not trained for political uh, life. He was a doctor, an eye doctor. 
and, and even some of the examples he gives are more medical in, in character. And so one of the things he said is, if you're dealing with cancer, you can't just cut, just spread. It takes a great deal of sophistication and care and precision. And everywhere that these bands are, you, if you just smash it, you, you attack a lot of civilians that are caught in the middle. Even civilians that may be aligned right now and confused with these forces. So it's constantly winning them over. And it's time after time also uh, providing amnesties again and again and again. Anyone who, you know, uh, lays down their arms or says that they've switched sides or says that they're no longer fighting the government has been welcomed back. That's extremely, extremely important. Um, it's the Syrian government that has time and again said that they're very much for a negotiated solution. The opposition to a negotiated solution has come from the so-called Free Syrian Army. Free Syrian Army is so chaotic they can't meet with each other and they're, they're fighting each other almost as much as they're fighting the government when they're not looting each other and each other's equipment. But the government has always been, and, and in his statements he made it clear, a negotiated solution is the only way. We should know that the Syrian Communist Party is, is part of the government now, and, and many forces. Um, the other point he made was to describe, he said, Syria and the countries of the region are, are very much built on, on two pillars, socially. Um, both pan-Arabism and, and Islam. And it was what was so destabilizing was the pitting of the, the right-wing Islamic current against the rest of society. Now, I, I want to say something on that. How did that come about? Because this also came up in a real way in the discussion uh, that uh, the Grand Mufti of Syria had. And, and also when we met with these Christian forces, they, they stressed again and again how much Syria has historically been a mosaic of many different uh, religious and ethnic groups and currents who've lived together and have a history of that. Um, but there again, it's U.S. policy U.S. policy that really began in both a response to the Iranian Revolution and the using of forces in Afghanistan as a way to mobilize the warlord forces and, and was very much reinforced. It, it, it's not just Saudi policy, this mobilizing of the Wahhabi, you know, religious um, forces and Taliban. It, it, that, this is U.S. War College policy. This is, this is the Pentagon that it's coming from. It's part of the sectarian violence of, of how to destroy the resistance in Iraq was to pit Sunni against Shia consciously. Put it on every ID card. Make it so you couldn't go from one block to the next every street corner divided, parts of the country divided, the, the, the parliament by how many blocks, how many seats, everything, everything divided. And that impacts the whole region. You feel it in Pakistan today, in, in, every, in every country in the region. It's had its impact in Egypt. So it we should just be aware that the level of sectarian violence and the consciously using one group against another um, and particularly trying to mobilize the, the Sunni forces against it was seen as, as seen both Iran and also Hezbollah in, in Lebanon how to try to pull Hamas in, in Gaza 
Palestinian struggle away and, and divide the resistance. And it goes on all the time, and there's a, an intense amount of disinformation and lies that are much more intense than all the lies and stories about gas. I mean, it goes on endlessly and at an intense level. So the forces who are standing up to this and saying, it can seem like a religious argument, you know, about the importance of respect for different religions and the importance of respect for diversity and, and, and so on. And we'd say, well, we're not religious. Is that important? But it's extremely important when you hear the debate and discussion. It's groups refusing to be used one against the other and also saying this isn't our tradition. Um, I, I could go into that more, but I, I think that this is um, kind of the, the main, the main uh, points for here and, and will be, uh, oh, I, I wanted to also yeah, ask a, a question about what we see for the future. What does it mean if Syria disarms? Um, the only thing that's under discussion uh, is the chemical weapons. And it, that depends on how far the U.S. wants to push. And you can see it's just an opening point for them. They say, well, it means chemical weapons. It also means the ability to deliver any kind of weaponry and all kinds of armaments. They'll, they'll put the kitchen sink into it if they're allowed. Um, and it's exactly what happened in Iraq, where weapons of mass destruction <coughs> meant that Iraq couldn't import pencils or x-ray machines because there's no form of technology that can't be used to also make a weapon. And a lot of that is also the fraud of the idea of, of weapons of gas are more deadly when we were there, it was the anniversary of Sabra and Shatila, when I think it was 4,000, somebody can correct me on the number, of Palestinians who were killed by the phalange, the fascist forces, as Israeli troops stood there. But they were overwhelmingly killed with knives and bayonets. But because they were disarmed and, and, and isolated, it could happen. So it, it's not just one form of weapon is more deadly than another. But in terms of um, Syria being disarmed of chemical weapons, as a state, they for a long time wanted to end the use of chemical weapons. They called for a weapons-free zone. And that was one point that Assad made and others have made. That, that their call in throughout the whole region, just as others have, as Iran has called for making the region a nuclear-free zone. Who, who brings in the nuclear weapons? Who has the nuclear weapons in the region? It's the U.S. and Israel. And so countries of the region have said, you know, let's disarm. Chemical weapons, nuclear weapons. Who, who maintains most of the weapons in the world today? Oh, the overwhelming majority comes from the U.S. And who holds it in the region? Overwhelmingly, the U.S. So at any rate, I don't think what's at all on the agenda is them uh, disarming their own defense and conventional weapons. And they have been doing um, pretty well in terms of organizing to push back the resistance. Uh, the, these, it's not resistance, these mercenary bands, these rebel bands. Uh, the government has been doing pretty well at that. I think they'll be able to continue, even though we need to be aware that more sophisticated weapons are coming in. But the danger of a U.S. bombing was what happens when, when that goes on, as we saw in Libya, as we saw in Iraq, as we saw in Yugoslavia. Remember in Yugoslavia, they destroyed 438 schools and 14 tanks. It's easy to hide a tank. For any, heaven's sakes, any haystack will do. But the schools 
what had been constructed was the target. That's what was destroyed in Libya. The communications, the electric grid, the Grand Waterway, which was a wonder in Libya. That's what was destroyed. That's what was intended to be destroyed. So the fact that the U.S. was stopping that 90 days of bombing, that they were just, you could feel them thirsting to carry it out, that is important. And it was a collective world movement that did it, and it's why we want to stay on the alert to stop that, because I, I really do think they can take care of business against all of these groups. Um, the U.S. was so anxious to bomb because all these diverse groups were losing. They haven't been able to really hold any ground unless they can hold ground where they're surrounded by civilians and the government is worried about killing a lot of civilians in order to root them out. So um, I think those answered most of the questions. And in the days ahead, we'll have to figure out how to really um, answer more of these. And I think both stay, stu they stay tuned, know that there's great determination there, and determination will continue here. Thank you. Okay, let's have another round for the two great talks. <coughs> the next corporate world meeting is Friday, September 27th, with reports on the Baltimore PPA Southern Workers Assembly and recent, the recent AFL-CIO convention. Please help put chairs away before leaving, and we'll see you next week. Oh, and just one, thing. one more announcement. There, there is this program in Queens. For obvious Adiki, it's the anniversary of her being sentenced, and it's on Monday. And, and anyone who can come, we're showing the film on Avia called Prisoner 650. It's in an outdoor uh, location right in the Pakistani uh, South Asian community there at 74th and Roosevelt. So please what time? Uh, do try to come. It's 7.30 until 9.00. Okay. Does anybody know what day tomorrow is? Yes. It's not hump day. <laughs> it's Dave Schechter's birthday. Yeah. Comrade Dave joined the party in 1968 through our youth organization, Youth Against War and Fascism, the same year I did. Uh, he'll be 76 years old tomorrow, 76 years old tomorrow. Uh, Dave came from a working class family in Yonkers. His father was a cab driver. Uh, when I met him, he was a, a union school teacher in New York City, in the UFT. His family was in the Communist Party, a once great organization that degenerated, and uh, he was drawn to the militant, po militant and pro-liberation politics of Workers World Party and YAW. 1968 was an was important year. It was the year that Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated and the country exploded in rebellion. It was the year of the Tet Offensive in Viet that turned the tide in the Vietnam War. It was the year of student rebellions in Colombia and around the country. And for us in Yoff, they were street fighting years when we were pioneering mobile tactics and disruptions. And I first met Comrade Dave, I think, on a demonstration when we disrupted the opening of a movie called The Green Berets with John Wayne uh, glorifying the Vietnam War. Uh, Yoff had a rep in those days. As, uh, uh, William Worthy, a black journalist, wrote an, an article for the Boston Globe saying, calling Yoff the cutting edge of the new left, and Comrade Day was one of the, one of the many comrades who made the, got us that reputation. Uh, he was one of those who went in and disrupted George Wallace when he spoke at Madison Square Garden, and uh, when he surrounded the, the garden with thousands outside, and a couple of hundred people went inside when George Wallace ran his fascist campaign for. Uh, president in 1968. And that year, Conrad Dave crossed the picket line, because that year there was a, a uh, struggle for community con for black community control in Ocean Hill Brownsville. And uh, the U United Federation of Teachers launched a racist strike against the black community. And Conrad Dave did not honor that strike. And it was a courageous stand to take. Mm -hmm. I also want to mention the fact is uh, we were also at that time we were the organization that was raising the issue of Palestine and the anti-war movement for the first time. Uh, we were the ones who were doing it, and it subjected us to a lot of tense situations, and Conrad Day was always on the front lines. I remember his arrest when we, uh, when Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel, was given the key to New York City, and um, 
we marched right into the middle of that ceremony at City Hall, in the middle of thousands of racist Zionists, and uh, uh, Dave was arrested that day. Uh, he was arrested many times. All of us were. He was, uh, uh, and it's, it's, that was 45 years ago, and in spite of a stroke that has caused, uh, seriously impaired his, his uh, physical ability, he's here with us tonight, and that's a great thing. So let's join me in welcoming, welcoming to the Happy Birthday. Thank you.